everyone who has joined us today for this webinar of the APA Water and Planning Network. Hosted by the Alliance for Water Efficiency, I am Ron Burke, the CEO at the Alliance. We're so glad you could join us today. Uh, next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping notes. This will be 60 minutes in length with some time for questions at the end. Um, I think you all know the drill at this point, uh, audio through your telephone or computer, microphone and speakers. We are muting uh, your lines during this presentation because it's being recorded. And please do type your questions into the chat throughout the webinar, uh, and we will tackle those at the end. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Alliance for Water Efficiency, We've been around uh, approximately 15 years, and our mission is to promote an efficient and sustainable water future. We have more than 530 member organizations throughout North America. Um, we're unique, I think, in that we bring together a really diverse network of experts and practitioners who work in the water efficiency space, folks who work for water agencies, planning agencies, um, corporations, consulting firms, plumbing manufacturers, so on and so forth. And we are the network where those folks come together to learn, to share. Um, we provide resources like uh, research and various tools and training and engagement opportunities to facilitate um, uh, this, this important work. Uh, if you would like to learn more, feel free to visit our website. If you're not already a member, I hope you'll consider becoming one. You know, we've worked uh, with a variety of uh, partners throughout the years. Um, and, and, and you'll hear more about the land use work we've done here a bit later. I wanted to flag in particular our NetBlue um, uh, model ordinance uh, that helps facilitate water neutral, neutral development. Um, that's something we're really proud of. And uh, you can learn more about, about that on our website. And again, if you're not a member, we hope you'll consider becoming one. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn it over now to our founding, the founding CEO of the Alliance for Water Efficiency, Marianne Dickinson, who's also the co-chair of the APA Water and Planning Network to get us started today. Marianne. Thank you, Ron. And thank you all for joining us on the webinar. We're very happy that you're all uh, attending it. Um, the, the American Planning Association created the Water and Planning Network because there was a need to address water planning and um, land use planning together rather than in separate silos as has historically been the case. And it's a free network where we invite water and land use professionals uh, to join. You don't need to be an APA or an even an AWRA, American Water Resources Association member to join. We, we, we just want to have as many people participating in our discussions as possible. So far, we've got about 450 uh, members in our network that get uh, regular newsletters and notices. We send stuff out on a monthly basis. We also do webinars like the one you're watching today. So if you'd like to be a, a member of that network, uh, please email us at water at and uh, either myself, uh, co-chair, or Bill Sesenick, who's co-chair with me, uh, will respond and make sure you're added to the list and, and part of our um, network. You can also follow us on Twitter, and there you see the, the Twitter handle there. So um, we're, we're very happy to be uh, working on this webinar with you today, and uh, um, we look forward to uh, your participation. Uh, I know you're all muted, but you can still type in questions into you know the the, uh, the question and answer box for GoToWebinar, and we, we are planning to allow a lot of time for questions at the end of the presentation. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Aaron Rugland um, and the next slide, Liam, uh, and Aaron will start us in our webinar. Thanks, Marianne, and thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Erin Rugland, and I'm a program manager at the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy, Center of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And I'm joined today with Sagar Shah of the American Planning Association, as well as Brad Spilka of the Alliance for Water Efficiency. And we are gonna talk about, uh, if you'll go to the next slide, a policy focus report and some associated background research that we all collaborate collaborated on on the topic of integrated land use and water management. 
So the report you see on the screen here is the newly released policy focus report from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy um, that includes a lot of the information that we'll talk about today, as well as things that we won't touch on today either, such as uh, four case studies of integrated land use and water management from across the country, um, some additional original analysis and policy recommendations at the end as well. Um, so next slide. Today, we will talk about the content that went into some of the supporting working papers. So original research that was done in order to create this policy focus report. And if you're particularly interested in some of the data that we're going to talk about today, um, you might check out the working papers um, in addition to the policy focus report as well. Next slide. So just to start us off, I want to give an overview of the importance of planning and why we're focused on planning in particular for these presentations today. Um, so we believe in general, as Marianne mentioned, in the integration of land use and water planning for more sustainable and resilient outcomes and to achieve water security and sustainability in our communities. And so building integration into the planning process is a foundational action for achieving this big goal. And the planning process can help us to systemically analyze uh, and implement opportunities for better coordinated land and water management um, just through the process of planning itself in that you have to do priority setting and identify different implementation actions that can really help you think through the best way to integrate land and water in your community as well as the best way to tee up the collaborative activities that will make um, this more feasible between a land use planning department and a water agency. And so while we recognize that plan preparation does not solve all of the issues of a community, right, you know, we talk about plans sitting on a shelf or otherwise not being implemented, um, we think it's a great step in order to tee up the implementation, implementation and collaborative activities that are required in integrating land and water planning. Next slide. And so today we will talk in depth about comprehensive land use plans. Sagar will cover the state of water and comprehensive plans across the United States, as well as water management plans, with which Brad will cover in his portion of the presentation. So I just wanted to start us off talking about the interconnections and crossovers between the two planning types. Um, so comprehensive plans being this great opportunity to articulate the value of water in your community and to hear from residents about whether water is a value and in which way they see it um, as a value. Um, and then it's also a great document clearly for involving numerous stakeholders and guiding those stakeholders in decision making about uh, development patterns, land use and urban form, as well as how physical water resources may be best utilized or protected for the location and cost of development. Um, so yeah, we just really advocate for water being woven into the policies, procedures and implementation actions of a comprehensive plan and Sagar's presentation will talk about how this does or does not happen currently. And then on the water management planning side, uh, we advocate that uh, water management staff connect with land use planners to gain this public engagement and participation experience, which is often lacking from the water planning process, um, as well as connect with land use planners in order to get water related policies into the city code or ordinances. And land use tools provide a great way for water management agencies to better manage the land use origins of the water issues, be it inefficiencies, different impervious surfaces and flooding issues or pollution sources. Um, though we also recognize that water management agency staff may have the added task of breaking down silos between not just themselves and land use planners, but themselves and various water management agencies. So of course, advocating for a one water or integrated water management approach. Um, and the way that land use shows up in water management plans tends to either inform the plans content or enables coordinated planning. Um, so this may be requirements to calculate the water demand according to local land use data and the information within a comprehensive plan or similar actions to that. 
or on the coordination side requirements to update a water management plan in tandem with land use planning activities or um, to require consultation and coordination between the two departments. And then Colorado deserves a shout out here as it's the only state that requires explicit consideration of land use within water efficiency plans beyond stormwater and landscaping techniques, which are required in many plans and also naturally have that land use connection. Next slide. And so now for my portion of the presentation, I'll dive a little bit more deeply into the overall tools for connecting land and water to further situate the planning process for us um, and explain again, like just drive home why the planning process seems to be particularly important in the overall development approval process. Next. Um, so when we say development approval process, this is what we mean, this process that starts with co collaborative processes that entail the administrative or procedural um, needs of a community, such as like reviewing development applications and things of that nature. Next is the planning process um, and, you know, teeing up those future activities and needs for a community. Then there's the regulation codes and ordinances buckets in which, you know, some of the things from plans may be codified or just other community needs and processes are enacted as policy for the community. And then there's development review in which you're reviewing site plans and collaborating with developers um, to ensure that development follows the city guidelines and codes, um, if not also, you know, doing that more collaborative approach to ensure that it is a development that will bring the most benefit to the community. And perhaps there's some water considerations built within that as well. Next is the water and infrastructure uh, building phase, uh, be that to serve particular developments or just to um, refresh what's needed for the community, make improvements and upgrades and what have you. And then finally, there is post-occupancy water demand management, um, those kind of water conservation or stormwater techniques that happen after a building is built, after it's occupied and typically targeting residents, business owners or other end users. Next slide. Um, so understanding that there are all these connection points for land and water, we convened a, an expert focus group uh, in preparation for this policy focus report to really help us tee in on how to make a tool that would help practitioners understand these different connection points and begin to get them started in understanding which particular point might be most useful for implementing within their community. Um, so our rationale for doing this was partly because there are numerous lists that do exist already for the intersection points of land and water, um, but they were not fully comprehensive and tended to like skew a little bit more towards the land use planning side than the water management side. And we also had the challenge of like, coordinating between the two professions, making sure that the language used for this list um, translated between the two, right? It's not like the, the two professions speak foreign languages or anything, but sometimes the same term can be interpreted differently across these two professions. Um, so next slide, I will again talk about these different processes and practices and tools for integrating land and water. The expert focus group helped us refine these categories. And so these are our main categories and the next couple slides will give examples of each. Next slide. So first we have collaborative processes, which again really speaks to the administrative and procedural uh, steps that are necessary in order to integrate land and water planning. Um, so in particular, I want to shout out the coordinated pre-application meetings in which water agency staff is in the room uh, reviewing development applications and giving feedback to the developer about how to become more water efficient um, or otherwise have input about the water management on property. Next slide. 
Next is the planning stage, which of course we'll talk more about. So suffice to say here that in addition to comprehensive and master plans and water resource plans, there are a few other planning types or planning activities that may be done within a community that also present ripe opportunities for integrating land and water. Next. And then we have regulations, codes, and ordinances, the way to really codify these different water-related policies in your community and ensure more consistent application. And so here I want to give another shout out to AWE's Net Blue initiative, as that would be a great uh, way to pursue this water demand offsets or water neutral code approach here, in addition to the more like standard codes that are present in every community, like building and plumbing codes, landscape and irrigation codes, or zoning and land use codes, using those to promote water efficiency and water efficient urban form. Um, and then also would be beneficial to implement a net blue approach or water neutral code in order to ensure that new development coming in does not necessarily increase the total water use of your community. Next slide. Then we have the development review phase, which again is just different mechanisms for the water agency staff to be involved in reviewing development proposals and ensuring that connection charges or developer incentives that may be required or offered uh, speak to water efficiency and sound water management on a particular site. Next slide. And then we have the water and infrastructure pieces. So this again could be as a result of a particular development like service line extensions, or it could just speak to the general like water infrastructure and upgrades that may be needed in your community. Um, so water reuse or recharge in particular for groundwater dependent communities, stormwater management, uh, super important nationwide, but especially for anyone experiencing huge and increasing storm events due to climate change. Next slide. And then finally, we're back at post-occupancy water demand management, uh, the ways in which you might influence uh, the end users of water to be more conserving. So through the rate structure, through fixture appliance or landscaping retrofits or rebates, or through water audits and leak detection. Next slide. So given all of these tools and practices, um, which are enumerated in this huge matrix within the policy focus report and the working paper itself, uh, we wanted to come up with a way for practitioners to start to discern between them and identify which ones might be most useful in their communities. Um, so to do that, we came up with these various categories of evaluation criteria, the first of which is the water issues category covering water adequacy, and water scarcity, flooding and combined system overflows, aging infrastructure and water quality. Um, so you'll see soon how this all plays out and how we identify which techniques map best to which water issue. And it's similar for the community goals of resilience and equity, which techniques can help you bounce back after some disruption in water supply or huge storm event and equity, which helps raise all boats, so to speak, in promoting equitable uh, access to high quality and affordable water. And then finally, this last evaluation category is more about the practical matters of the magnitude of cost and ease of implementation. And so magnitude of cost, by that we mean um, how much does it cost compared to doing this in a siloed manner, to do it in an integrated manner across land and water resources, as many of these uh, techniques are kind of status quo things pursued by community anyway. How much does it cost to do it in a new, uh, new and innovative manner? And then finally, the ease of implementation. How politically feasible is it to pass something like this? Next slide. And so this is just an example of the matrix that we put together with the top 10 tools according to experts, because uh, again, enumerating all these practices uh, is a pretty physically large thing that doesn't fit on a PowerPoint slide, but is present within the policy focus report and associated working paper. Um, so just to help you read this here, a blank spot means that that technique does not really influence that um, evaluation criteria. So for instance, right in water rates not necessarily making an impact on the issue of aging infrastructure. 
a white dot means that it influences it a little bit or maybe has potential to influence it. So public engagement and participation can have, you know, moderate impacts on flooding, depending on how it's uh, undertaken. The gray dots are that it does have some impact on it. So developer incentives have, you know, a potential impact on water quality, the ability to do that. Uh, a normal black dot means that it does have a, a good impact and can be useful. So coordinated data and information, our experts said, um, has an effect on the resilience of your community. And then finally, the double dots means highly effective. Um, so we think that comprehensive and master plans is really effective for addressing issues of water adequacy or scarcity uh, and same for water resource plans. So the, the last thing I'll point out on this slide is just that column of tools. Again, these are the top 10 tools according to experts. You see comprehensive and master plans in there and water resource plans, as well as numerous uh, coordination activities. So in addition to planning, coordination in general is a really crucial step to take for integrating land and water. Next slide. And then just to wrap us up, um, two takeaways. The first being that communities are best served by evaluating these different practices according to what their needs are. So while we made this matrix and have it kind of generalized as to what we think the normal or average situation might be, any community would be benefited by kind of going through that themselves and identifying factors that are most uh, relevant to their local environment and their local political context. Um, so work through it systemically in that way and see what might be best implemented for their particular context. And then finally, the, these tools, practices and processes for integrating land and water are highly interconnected. Um, they'll be stronger if they're implemented across the development approval process generally, if multiple techniques are implemented within a community. And theoretically, this will lead to cost savings too as um, these efficiencies are built in and used more effectively over time. And with that, next slide, I'll turn it over to Sakar Shah to talk about the comprehensive planning side of things. Um. Thank you, Erin. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are located. Um, so as Erin mentioned, I will be talking about the water elements in comprehensive land use planning. And this is sort of a project we did uh, with Babbit Center and AWE, uh, I think before a year and a half. So and the working paper link that Erin showed us, showed you all in the beginning, sort of uh, gives a detailed explanation of our work. Um, so with that, my name is Sagar Shah and I work at American Planning Association. Um, I am a planning and community health manager here. I work in the research department. Um, so my main role is to create um, educational products, trainings, um, et cetera, for planners to integrate health equity into their planning practice. And uh, of course, water is a very access to clean water is a very essential part of being of creating healthy communities. So I was very interested in this project and very happy to be part of he, part of this uh, webinar and share what we found out um, or what we did in this project with you all. Next slide, please. So the focus of the project, as I mentioned, was understanding uh, how is water integrated into comprehensive plans nationwide. And in order to do that, we did two things. One is we looked at the state legislature and developed uh, uh, a database of various questions that we asked, and I'll go over them uh, here. And then we did some key informant interviews to know like, uh, just to like how is water land use integrated and what are the nuances when it comes to planning practice at local level. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, database development, we reviewed the state planning enabling legislation of all 50 states and we asked a series of 11 questions. Um, Brad, uh, or you can click one more time so that we can get all the questions. Thank you. Uh, these are some of the examples to give you in terms of to show you what we are. So we, we looked at the 11 questions for 50 states and we we looked at the planning enabling legislation to see are local plans mandated by state law. If they are, how often the plan should be updated or, re, or, or rewritten. Uh, are they, uh, does the state 
legislation specify or suggest elements of comprehensive plan? Are there any threshold criteria in terms of are, are does the state law require some communities to do comprehensive planning and doesn't doesn't require other communities to do it? So those type of threshold criteria. What are how are plans formally adopted at local legislative by local legislative body and uh, do comprehensive plan need to get approved from any state agency commission or department and in planning case as many of you may know planning is usually done at local level it's not done at state level only handful of states have a, even a state planning department so in that case the the, the response was really low in terms of not many um, plans need to get a, a state agency commission or department approval um, next slide please So for the purpose of this, and if you can get detailed answers to all these questions and what we found in the in the working paper that I talked about before and Erin Erin had provided the link. What I will do is for the purpose of this presentation, I will go over uh, some couple of questions that were important to us and I think would be very relevant to this group uh, who are present here. Um, so in terms of our review of the state legislature we found that we, we looked into how is water element integrated into comprehensive plan so for as you see on the on the slide there are five states arizona delaware florida maryland pennsylvania that requires water element to be explicitly uh integrated into comprehensive plan so there's like hey you need to this is the list of this is the list of elements and water needs to be there you are required to add that as part of comprehensive plan uh, the there are five states where water element is mandated but is part of another element and I'll, I'll i'll talk about what those other elements are and there are four states that require water element are included in requirements but they don't provide any extensive detail in terms of what they mean by water element it's just like a reference um, in passing next slide when it comes to uh, optional element water is an optional element there are two states that requires water as a separate element but it's optional so they are not the communities are not required to have it as a as a as a as a mandatory element in the comprehensive plan but if they want to they can add it as a as a separate element uh, there are six states where water is part of another optional element so it, water is not an element by itself but part of another element and there are six states where water is optional of course and included in objectives goals and purposes what it means is the state laws would say that you first of all inclusion of water is optional and second is you can it can be part of comprehensive plan goals or objectives or purposes but there's a very soft way of saying that hey consider water but you're not required to do it uh, there were 14 states where water is optional and included as part, as part of general recommendation and what we mean is uh, there were there are 14 states that mentioned that think about uh, location of water wells or think about location of water so water sources in 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 land use plan etc so it was just like mentioning like that but not talking about any about water in any other detail beyond that and there were 12 states which is concerning water is not mentioned in the contents of comprehensive plans itself and i would like to mention here that the the scope uh, for our research was limited into looking into planning enabling laws so not beyond that but there are 12 states that don't require any men that don't mention any sort of like water integration or even the term or the word water uh, into the comprehensive plan requirements so overall there are like about 14 states that that uh, that has some type of requirement of uh, uh, water element into comprehensive plan and there are about 36 states that have some optional element and some 12 states that don't even mention um, uh, comprehensive plans in their requirement next slide please so in terms of the key takeaways we found is uh, water is most often included as i mentioned and in, uh, under the utilities and community facilities element so if water is not a separate element by itself then it will be included into utilities and community facilities element which is uh, which is okay and which is understandable and if not included in those two then it falls under mostly conservation natural resources and land use element 
We also found that water has been mandated in a variety of ways in comprehensive plan, but the most common uh, themes for water element where water supply and demand stormwater management sanitation and drainage those were the ways they the water was integrated into comprehensive plan uh, we also found that conservation protection of water resources and environmental impacts were common themes but not as integral a part of comprehensive plan and were, were often left to the discretion of individual jurisdictions so this is where they recommend something but don't provide uh, uh, a lot of other guidance when it comes to conservation protection of resources and environmental impacts we also found that states that specifically required water element uh, especially the i think the first nine states that i showed in the first slide they provide extensive detail in terms of uh, how to integrate water into land use plan that is and and, and other policies um, recommendations policies goals objectives etc uh, in a comprehensive plan and in contrast to their counterpart which don't require what was element there is like sheer mention of it in passing or uh, no basically no guidance in terms of how to how to do that or there's no requirement next slide so that was the review of state laws for all 50 states and uh, the second part of the project as i mentioned before was to talk with uh, Keen, to do like key informant interviews and the purpose of doing that was twofold one is to get feedback on the data collector right so we were collecting this data and as you all know state laws are very uh, sometimes it's subjective and uh, we wanted to confirm with uh, with practitioners in terms of what we had collected resonated with them uh, for their own state and are were, the, were there any changes required in what we had collected so that was the first purpose. And the second purpose was to know more specific about land use and water integration uh, in practice. Like how are they they using it? How how is it been done in their state and in their community? Um, next slide, please. So uh, for the key informant interviews, we interviewed planning planning practitioners. So these are planners working on water related issues. So uh, they. And of the one additional criteria we used was we tried to interview practitioners that had a larger perspective of what is happening at state level rather than just their own community of water district. So that was important criteria as well to select these uh, practitioners to interview. The questions that you see on the slide are an example of what type of questions we we asked them. So we asked about their about the knowledge of how historically the water element was added to the list of elements if they had some knowledge there and what what triggered or what motivated states to add that element uh, how does planning work in practice and how is the implementation done in comprehensive plan because as we know um, there are state laws but many of the state laws are not enforceable so i just wanted to know like how is being implemented and is it really done by the local uh, municipalities in their state we also wanted to know about drive what drives water inclusion what are the issues that drives water inclusion into comprehensive planning in their states we also wanted to know about some examples and successes with water and land use integration so those are those are the type of questions we asked them next slide please and i'll briefly go over some of the highlights of the six states or six practitioners from different states that we that we interviewed the first one is florida florida is one of the state there where water element is explicitly required in florida they mentioned that water conservation is a priority statewide and i think this was the only state out of the six that mentioned that they also mentioned that the governor de has has um, identified water conservation as a top priority and has been providing resources uh, and support to do that which was a this was a good news for for the state um, water has been an integral part of comprehensive planning and development and they feel local communities are doing a good enough job to like integrate that uh, major issues uh, that people don't often we always talk about flooding when it comes to florida but they also talked about how drought drought and salt water intrusion is a uh, one of one of the major issues when it comes to central florida uh, they also talked about uh, use of treated water for landscape irrigation so i think uh, 
Florida and one other state talked about sort of one water approach and they provided examples of a couple of communities that have done like their example communities best practices that uh, smaller communities that have done really good job of using uh, wastewater for landscape irrigation uh, at, at a larger scale. So that was some of the some of the highlights of the Florida interview. The second uh, state we looked at was Hawaii. And Hawaii is a state where water element is included in the requirements. So, but not with extensive details. So it is like, well, yeah, you are required to talk about water into your comprehensive plans, but there is no other guidance in terms of how would you integrate water into your comprehensive plans. So that is one. Hawaii is one of those those type of state. Um, in Hawaii, the one thing that came uh, was highlighted in the interview was the issue of equity. Uh, and thus water inclusion is many times driven through uh, litigation because as I mentioned, uh, there is no concrete guidance in terms of how to integrate water into comprehensive plans. Uh, and I talking about equity, the biggest uh, pain point I think or the challenge that was identified was uh, where water planning was sort of done and where people live, right? So they mentioned that uh, Hawaii's biggest uh, industry, economic industry is tourism, and they feel that the there is a lot of support in terms of thinking about water land is integration, water availability, accessibility, quality, etc. When it comes to the areas that are tourist oriented and commercialized, while the areas where native and local people live are often neglected. So that was an equity equity issue that was brought up, and I think this was the only state that talked about equity as an issue when it comes to came to water planning. They also and because of the and lack of equity goes hand in hand with lack of bottom up support. So it's like it's the water planning is done through legislation and sorry, sorry, uh, water planning is done through litigation and then there is lack of like bottom up approach. It's always like coming from top down approach. So that was one of the uh, thing that was highlighted as a challenge uh, to create an equitable uh, distribution of water. Next slide, please. The third state we interviewed was Maryland. Maryland is again like Florida, where water elements is explicitly required, and has pro and the state provides very good direction in terms of how to integrate water into comprehensive plan. Um, and they mentioned that traditionally sufficient portable and wastewater capacity uh, has driven water and impacts of what storm water has has driven water inclusion in in Maryland. Uh, they they also mentioned about like I think this was the only state that mentioned the, the the connection between water planning and climate change and how state is thinking about enhancing resiliency and climate change more when it comes to water planning. So they are thinking about future and how it impact how climate change is going to impact their state. Uh, moving on to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is a, again another state that requires water plan explicitly. In Pennsylvania, uh, the was the state I think that only mentioned integrated approach to water resource management and they say water state has given um, importance to it, have provided resources for it, have provided support to do that. Uh, drivers in Pennsylvania are quality and supply like maybe many other states and one water approach they feel will be strengthened in future because of this integrated approach uh, to water resource management they, that the state wants to focus on. Um, next slide. Utah was the, the fifth state. Utah is a state where water is an optional element and are included and, I, and the direction is to include it in like other ways such as being part of like objectives or goals of comprehensive plan. And in, in Utah, uh, water, water land use integration is driven at local level because of course it's not required at state level. Uh, one thing to highlight about Utah is they mentioned that the water is actually there's a typo here water is not on the top of people's mind but the importance is gaining so when they do this public engagement activities when they ask about people's priority water doesn't rise to the top and that's why it has been sort of historically neglected in some parts of utah and they mean they think that educational campaigns uh, that prioritizes and makes people understand about water issues and the scarcity of water would really help uh, the state of utah the last state we interviewed was Wisconsin, um, uh, where we and Wisconsin, Wisconsin is a state where water element is mandated with other element. And in Wisconsin, I think it again depend on the very where community is in Wisconsin. There was one 
one part of Wisconsin that water is not a big issue, but in other it is. So that's that was very much similar to other states. They also talked about alignment between plans and zoning codes and building codes and how important it is to to not only recommend in comprehensive plan but also implement those recommendations through zoning and building codes uh last slide yeah so i'm sorry i, I think i'm one minute two minutes over my time i'll quickly go over uh, the concluding thoughts the common theme that were mentioned by almost all of them was there needs to be collaboration and this is like vertical and horizontal collaboration between communities as well as uh, between plants and then lack of lack of fiscal support or finding fiscal support sort of uh, is very important for this integration common drivers no surprise water availability and water quality were the main dri common drivers uh, state we Equity of water was not mentioned often, as I mentioned before, except Hawaii. Nobody mentioned thinking about equity when it came to water planning. And um, they also thought about like a couple of communities mentioned about climate change and water resource management together. Uh, I mentioned Maryland, but there was one other state. I forgot which one it was that mentioned about that 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 uh, thinking about them together. And in concluding comment, I would say that we felt like and I think the interviewees uh, agreed that state law state laws had impact on how water is integrated into the comprehensive plans and um, even though they're not enforceable from locality or, or locality to locality or municipality to municipality i think it they mentioned that it really made really made sense to have state laws that sort of mandate or require land use and water integration and some states that provide some support and guidance on how to do that so thank you uh, and i hand it over to brad for the next portion all right thank you uh, so our project focus was understanding water in comprehensive plans nationwide and we want to conduct research on the database development and key informant interviews and just taking a better look at the reason why water and land use planning have historically been disconnected next slide So water element in comprehensive plans. So we noticed after doing all this that um, there was only four states where water element was explicitly required. And there was, again, only this time, only five water elements mandated within another element. And water elements included in the requirements of expensive detail in only four states. So as you can see, this is really just only a small subset of states where water elements were in comprehensive plans. That was a really important finding. Next slide. So water is most often included under elements, utilities, community facilities, conservation, natural resources, land use. It's included in a variety of ways, such as water supply and demand, stormwater management, sanitation, and drainage, and some other common themes are conservation, protection of water resources, and environmental impacts. So we saw that states that specifically require water element provide extensive details in contrast to their counterpart, states that require water within another element. So in whole, the states that really had a section for water elements really uh, had more details about it and there was a lot more information in contrast to when it was just only included as a subsection. Next slide. So, oh, so the interviewed planning practitioners on working on water-related issues. So some of our main questions were, do you have knowledge on when and how the water element was added to the list of elements? What drives water inclusion and comprehensive planning? Have there been major successes with water and land use integration? How do water planning work in practice and implementation with the comprehensive plan? And do you anticipate more integration of water and land use planning in the future? Next slide. So key themes. So, so many of our states, two viewed here, Maryland and Pennsylvania, were some of the better states with all this information. So with Maryland, we know that there is traditionally sufficient potable and wa potable water and wastewater capacity and impacts of stormwater have driven water inclusion. Hey, Brad. Water plant 
sorry to interrupt. I think we need to skip ahead. This is still Sagar's presentation. I think we have some repeating slides. Here we go. Okay. That, so we're going to, okay, so here we go. The problem, as I mentioned, water utility planning and local community comprehensive planning have historically not been well connected. We've had strong silos that have existed for decades within minimal staff interchange and water utility managers historically have been nervous about looking like they're social nears. Um, you know, water utility managers would rather prefer to stick to technical and quantitative side of water plans. And this disconnect occurs despite clear evidence that a lack of coordination is a disservice to a local planning needs and results in a lack of focus on the very real water and land use nexus. Next slide. So to investigate this issue, AWE and ELI, along with Aaron Ruglin of the Babbitt Center, looked at 50 states inventoried for laws and regulations requiring water utility plans and coordination with local comprehensive plans. In addition, we did six case study interviews, which were more in depth, with an overall goal to determine which states have the most robust requirements that can serve as models for states lacking such mandates. Next slide. Methodology. So we used an inventory to create legal requirements for water utility plans in all 50 states. We had seven questions that were answered for each state about water utility planning requirements and laws and how land use factors are considered. And we researched answers and they compiled them in the state, state database posted as Appendix A in the main report with legal citations, courtesy of ELI for all yes answers. Next slide. So our three main observations were that there was a wide diversity in state water utility planning requirements and how utility plans must connect with local land use. Almost zero states had overlapping requirements and the disparity among states was very drastic. And this lack of homogeneity occur, occurs among state water utility planning requirements just because of the different natural resource challenges and political climates found throughout the 50 states, whether it's geographical or the state government infighting and how things are, there is a lot of different planning requirements. But that leads to significant opportunity for states to learn from each other and better address land use considerations in future planning. Next slide. So here are some general statistics. Uh, I'll run through some of them really quick. 32 states required water utilities to submit plans and the details varied significantly. 10 topics were inventoried and no state requires inclusion of all 10, which was a major fact. Fewer than half of all the 32 states require water supply assessments. Uh, 11 states had what we considered great depth and breadth of detail, whereas only one state required climate change and only one state required stormwater, California and Maryland respectively. Next slide. So here is how the data is visually presented. Any state with a yes for that category was inserted in with their initials. The biggest takeaway in my opinion is that no one topic had more than half of the United States with a yes, which shows that there really is huge room for improvement all across the board. Next slide. So land use coordination was even less common than most other aspects of water utility plans. We only had nine states that require water utilities to incorporate land use planning into their water plans. And a main takeaway was that the methods vary considerably across all nine states. Only 10 states required community land use plans to incorporate water utility plans or water quality and quality concerns. And only three states provide by statute funding or other systems to help support coordination between water utilities and land use planners. Interestingly enough, the only state that satisfied all three of those major requirements was Maryland. Next slide, please. So here's some additional land use coordination stats. About 50% of states expressly mention water supply in statutes or regulations that specify the required content of land use plans. Each of the 10 states required unique water elements to be included in the land 
land use plans. Some of these were stormwater, groundwater, wetlands, and wellhead considerations, all showing the increased diversity that there is among land use coordination and how there really is no one set way to address it. And only six states required that water utilities directly coordinated with land use planners in their communities. Next slide, please. So as previously mentioned, we did six in-depth case study interviews with representatives from California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Minnesota, and Washington. The goal those states were picked is because they had some great laws and also they represented great geographic diversity in terms of just location across the United States and the watershed problems. Next slide. So why we, why we chose these six states, strong water utility planning requirements. They have a history of working in the land use and water issue, as I mentioned, some of our best states, the geographic diversity and a standard set of questions and operational lessons for other states could be interpreted. We have standard set questions asked and answered are detailed in our report. Next slide, please. So we learned 11 main lessons from the surveys and the interviews. There were some great takeaways. I'm gonna run through them real quick. So learn, we learned that strengthening water supply and land use plan connections is needed on a nationwide level. Uh, providing funding can be an important incentive. Adopting robust water utility planning requirements in a law can accelerate the coordination with land use agencies. Adopting separate legislation requiring large developments can produce better coordination. Creating training programs helps water utilities and land use planners work together. Um, coordinating with voluntary organizations to focus on water and land use planning is a platform for improvement. Next slide. And our final few lessons, adopting a mandatory water element can be a good catalyst to achieving better coordination. Working in a single jurisdiction is easier. Adopting local aquifer protection programs can be successful in helping to secure source water protection at the land use planning level. Encouraging water utilities to work with new development projects to require efficiency measures and to reduce the expected water use can improve working relationships with both water and land use staff. And finally, having state guidance and law is a key to success. Next slide. So if you wanna read the full paper, it is available on the Lincoln Institute's website. It's really informative and it talks both about all the information presented in today's webinar. Next slide. And our final conclusion and recommendations as we've seen, local collaboration is crucial to developing these relations between land use and water planners, and that the planning and water professionals have much to offer each other. They both have important insight about different issues. As they've worked separately for so long, having that extra coordination can really improve laws in the future. And requirements are floors, not ceilings. You want to explore the best options for your local context, looking for peer examples within your state and elsewhere. Some states succeed in one area, other states were better in other areas. And just looking at those examples can show how you can adopt better laws and to share lessons learned to everyone. The more information shared about land and water use planning, the better that all states can adapt. Next slide. And that will just about wrap it up for everyone here. So thank you for joining to everyone who's listening in on the call. So all right. Well, hey, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. We'll take a few minutes now to, to walk through those. Um, you can also email Liam. Uh, at that email address if your questions have not been answered due to time constraints or you just want to get an answer offline. That's okay too. Uh, a PDF and link for the webinar recording will be sent to you in a few days. I uh, just wanted to flag that um, uh, we do have a roundtable, AWE has a roundtable discussion coming up uh, in April looking at strategies for delivering water conservation programs to disadvantaged households. Um, you can email Liam for more information about that as well. 
be sure to check out our website and um, sign up for uh, regular updates. And of course, uh, you can sign up for regular news from the Water and Planning Network at wateratplanning.org. All right, Liam, do we have any questions? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, first off, uh, how do developer incentives impact equity? Why do rates not impact equity? Thanks for your question. Um, I think developer incentives can relate to equity from like an affordable housing point of view and from a density point of view, so to speak. And then I think as far as rates go, they do. Um, so what is published in the report might be slightly different than what's published on the slide that I showed, for example, we did a few refining in between the two steps. Um, but yeah, rates, especially having like a base rate that is good for the amount of water needed to survive, that is affordable, um, really important for equity, and then can also be important for ensuring water conservation among other users. I think the only caveat there is that um sometimes those rates don't necessarily speak to really high income folks who can afford to pay them so if you think about like landscaping in particular um a high income person might be more willing to have a really water intensive landscape and pay those like higher fees for it because they can afford to do that um so that would just be like the other side of the equity and rates conversation and i welcome other thoughts on that as well All right, thank you, Aaron. Uh, if no one else has anything to add to that, I'll go on to the next question. Um, is the saltwater intrusion because of subsidence in Florida? I think that might be for yeah. Stringer. Yes, I think that was the that was the reason. Uh, and I think they also mentioned about how. Uh, as I, I think I mentioned in my uh, in my in my talk, they were thinking about like i think um northwest and central central florida where there is a larger issue of that thing yeah this is ron with awe i'll just mention that uh florida is unique in so many ways um and one of those ways of course is that it's growing so rapidly folks working in florida i'm sure are very familiar with that um and the state recently passed a law that's unique, I believe, to Florida that will require uh, essentially a discontinuation of wastewater treatment discharges to surface water in 10 years, um, which is pretty dramatic uh, in a lot of ways, essentially re will require most um, uh, wastewater to be recycled, reused. So uh, there's, they're doing this for a number of reasons to help you know, manage the water supply reliability, given that some of the aquifers are not being replenished quickly enough. They're also doing it to minimize, um, to address kind of water quality concerns uh, and to deal with some of the saltwater intrusion and so forth. So um, fascinating stuff happening in Florida. All right, thank you both. Uh, next question, uh, did you find there were further silos in water, such as stormwater supply, wastewater, that further complicated overall integrated planning with land use? Yeah, I can start us off and then maybe Brad or Marianne can speak to that as well. Um, I think what we saw out of AWE's work is like a clear silo of different water topics. I think the actual barriers that individual water providers might uh, encounter depends on their local context in terms of how many water management agencies exist in their service area. So some might do both drinking water and wastewater, and that's at least two silos covered within one agency so that will be a little less of a barrier and maybe they just have to work on coordinating with like a flood control district or something like that whereas others might be completely siloed one drinking water agency one 
wastewater agency, one storm or flood agency. And so that would be more difficult to overcome. So it's a little context dependent, but yeah, certainly there are additional barriers depending on how many different agencies one might have to work with. All right, does anybody else have anything to add to that? Um, this is Marianne. I'll just add to Aaron's answer that uh, stormwater is not typically allied with most water utility uh, services. There are some utilities that do handle stormwater, but very, very few nationally. So it is a, a program that's sort of out there on its own, and um, integration has is, is been historically uh, needed for sure and uh, difficult to get done. Yeah, and I would add in terms of uh, comprehensive plans and and the way pra land, uh, planning practitioners are thinking at local level, they have that frame in mind in terms of stormwater management because there is so much literature, so much focus in planning on climate change resilience, stormwater management, rule of stormwater management, aid and green infrastructure. But uh, that's where the pain point is basically that there may be some thinking over there, but not beyond that. And the, sometimes they feel that that's enough. So that's a that's an important question actually. Okay, thank you. Um, someone was asking uh, for clarification on which, uh, what's the one state that includes climate change in its planning? It does. So I want to clarify, it does not include climate change in planning. Uh, in Maryland, the state of Maryland, uh, one of the questions that we asked the interviews was, what do you see the future of water and planning integration? And the state of Maryland mentioned that uh, the state is thinking of uh, thinking about water from the aspect of climate change and integrating it with the land use planning. So I would correct, I would clarify myself there that it's not done, but they're thinking about future of this happening. If the question is specifically about climate change and land use planning, I think Hawaii passed uh, uh, is the only state, according to my knowledge, because we did a separate project with FEMA where we looked at natural disasters and land use planning. And I think Hawaii is the only state that before a couple of years, they added climate change as an element of comprehensive planning. There's no other state that mentions climate change in the context of comprehensive planning. To add to, to his answer, though, uh, in terms of water utility plans, there is a state that has climate change as an element in the water utility plans, and that's California. But that's the only state. All right. Um, next question. Do you have a program approach for reaching out to states to encourage improved integration efforts? Yeah, we don't have a program approach per se um, for like a little bit of like organizational issues such like the Lincoln Institute is not allowed to lobby for instance. So we can't be systematic in that way just based on our organizational structure. Um, we tend to work directly with communities on the integration of land and water um, through our program called Growing Water Smart, which is currently held in Arizona and Colorado and is coming to Utah this year. Um, so in short, not a systematic approach state by state per se. Um, however, we are already seeing movement at the state level in this area. So for instance, a few years ago when the Babbitt Center started this work, um, we did an evaluation of water and comprehensive planning across the Southwest. And some of those materials were used to improve Colorado statute for water and land use planning. So water is now an optional element in statute, but before it was completely absent from Colorado. And then even this month, I believe, the Utah legislature just passed a requirement for water and comprehensive planning as well. And so that's not reflected in our materials because it is such a new development. Um, but yeah, there's some movement on this front nationwide, nonetheless. I I would add that APA as well, similar to Lincoln, we don't have a lobbying arm. We are not. We are a nonprofit. We don't lobby. However, we have uh, we have public affairs and advocacy uh, department at APA, and the role of that particular department is to advocate for state level and federal level policy. Um, 
advocacy and uh, I th if and they we have a priority areas and one of the priority area for this year I think next year is climate change. Uh, we also work with so that is one way of like uh, helping uh, as you may all know st most and I mentioned before that uh, state level there may not be planning agency there may be DOT DOH uh, but not not planning agency. So what we do is we work with our APA chapters and APA chapters are nothing but we have like a state level we have APA has about 47 chapters one representing each state. So we work with uh, local chapters to help them sort of advocate for specific issues that they are interested in. So if water is a issue that has been identified by a state chapter, then we would help them advocate for law change uh, uh, in that in that particular state. And this is Ron with AWE. I'll just mention that we do lobby. Uh, and uh, at the local state and federal level to advance water efficiency um, related to this topic we're going to be releasing our um, semi-regular uh, water efficiency state scorecard at the end of this year and for the first time we have added questions uh, around about land use the land use and water policy connections as well as uh, water and climate water and energy connections so um, states' grades will in part be influenced by whether or not they have some of these good policies to advance land use and, and water planning uh, coordination. Okay, thanks everybody. We do have a few more questions. I can try to get through a couple more here. Um, someone asks, would it be easier to have land use planning required in water management or water management requirements in land use planning? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that either is easier on their face because either way it requires coordination between departments and getting stakeholders together that may not normally meet. Um, so I don't wanna be too flippant in my answer, I guess, so to speak. I think we see a lot of materials prior to this report focusing on land use planning because that may seem a little more straightforward potentially. Um, based on the fact that like comprehensive planning is already an interdepartmental activity or is at least supposed to be, whereas water resource planning is a little more siloed in the water department and a little more focused on operations rather than visioning and strategies. Um, so that would be one answer, but I'll welcome my other panelists to speak up too. Yeah, I, I would say that Yes, it's a, I, I think that's what we want to do. And I think we found from our interviews that the states that had some type of requirements uh, in their laws and in the communities that were proactive in doing that were had good coordination when even when it comes to like uh, water managers and planners, etc. The one thing that came from one interview and we found uh, from other literature was that the issue and i think mentioned in my in my talk the what comprehensive plan when they do we elevate uh, we do com uh, community engagement and we elevate the issues that are most important to community members and those are what are addressed in comprehensive plans and many times because lack of awareness and lack of like i don't know what people don't resonate with that issue and that's not like brought up to the front in terms of thinking about it rather something like uh, physical activity or climate change etc so if that happens i think uh, that would go a long way in terms of making that having that type of like educational campaign to let people know what is happening with water and making that a priority for them so that it goes into this uh, plans and policies not only comprehensive plans but in other work that planners and water managers do And this is Marianne. I'll just throw out my opinion that I think it needs to be in both places. So it's not enough to do it in one side or the other. Uh, you know, water needs to be in comprehensive planning. Uh, comprehensive planning needs to be integrated into water utility plans. It has to happen in both directions, in my opinion. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so next question is, uh, how can community engagement and equity advisory committees be integrated earlier in the capital planning process? Uh, 
Anybody want to speak to that? I would just say that that's, <laughs> I would say it's a good idea. I think lot, some communities are doing it depending on the resources and plans they have. But I agree that comprehensive plans happens sometimes one in 20 years, once in 30 years, while capital improvement plans are done at a faster frequency and, and they add teeth to the bite, let's say, what comprehensive plans wants to do and that's why some of the practitioners we talked about talked about that internal consistency in terms of hey you have something in comprehensive plan but it needs to also be parallel with like zoning regulations building codes capital improvement plans etc uh, i don't think i answered your question i think it's a good idea and some communities are doing it uh, but i think it depends on what type of resources and the and the uh, preferences are of the community All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, this has been a very informative webinar. Uh, and if your question did not get answered, uh, feel free to email me. It's liam at a4we.org, and I will connect you with the appropriate speaker to answer your question. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.